This weekend, we are continuing in our new series. We're calling it, I've Got Issues. I've Got Issues. And as promised, the issue we're going to talk about today is one that I think we all struggle with. It is the issue of anger. Anger. In fact, let me just take a little poll. How many of you this week have done something, said something, acted in a way that you didn't want to act in because of anger? You've done something, said something, been angry to somebody because of anger. How many of you right now are judging the person sitting beside you and you're angry about it because they're not raising their hand? And you're like, I know you were angry this week. Raise, you're like, raise your hand. Remember what you said to me? Remember what you did? We all get angry, don't we? We all have things in our lives that cause us to be angry, and anger is something that we all deal with and we all have dealt with probably today, definitely this week, but it has affected us in some way. And so, so we all deal with anger, but let, let me make you feel at ease just a little bit, and I'll go first. All right, I'll go first. So I love to coach my son's uh, basketball team, football team, any team they can play on. I love to coach it. I love, I love the idea of just being able to see them play and being right there with them as they're playing. I love seeing how they improve. I love having the other players on the team and having influence in their life, being able to speak into them, teach them about the game. Oftentimes, you'll have people come in like we're doing flag football right now, have people come in and they don't know how to play, they don't know anything about flag football, and you get to teach them the game, you get to see the game play. But I also have to admit, I'm very very competitive, like super competitive. Like you think you're competitive, come on, let's go. I, I will out-competitive you in competitiveness. That's how competitive I am. And so I love to win. I'm competitive. I get, I'm also, something that is good to know, I'm a stickler for the rules when it comes to sports. And here's the reason why, because I want to know the rules because I intend on coaching in a way to manipulate the rules, all right? So I want to know the rules so that I can know what are the plays I can do that will use these rules against my opponent. And so I want to know the rules, and I want the rules to be followed very, very much. And so just recently, we're going into a game, and we're actually um, going into this game to play the best team in the flag football league. Like, no doubt about it, they are the best team. You know, if you've ever coached Little League, you know, you're dealing with 9 to 14-year-olds as the eight span that I'm coaching. And I mean, there's such a difference between nine to 14, but even 13-year-olds look a lot different. You might get some 13-year-olds like this and some 13-year-olds like this. And this team, this particular team, just got a bunch of 13-year-olds 13 13 like this. In fact, no lie, not exaggerating, they have a six foot two or three 13-year-old on their team who is an athlete, who's an amazing player. So we're going to this game, and I know like this is gonna be our tough opponent. This is one of the better teams. Also, that weekend... I lost my best player, my star player, the one who has helped lead us to two championship seasons in a row to a broken arm. And not only did he break his arm, and he's not going to be able to play football, but he's a family friend, one of our closest friends, and so a friend of my son, and I'm just bummed for him. It's his birthday week, and so he's getting ready to go into his birthday, and I'm bummed about that. So we're going into that. We're playing the best team. I don't have my star player. Then I had one of those days at work. Have you ever had one of those days at work where you just are like, oh. And you're like, you're the pastor of a church. You have days at work that are like bad. I'm like, yes, okay. We are Christians, but we sin too. And so we, we had, had one of those days at work that just got me in a bad mood. Had some personal stuff dealing with, finding out things about, just kind of walking through. So I'm kind of angst up anyway. So walk into the game, and, and we're out there, and the, the team has started driving all the way down the field already. Their, their guys are all over us. They're just they're beating us. We, 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 getting, we were on defense first because we won the, the to, uh, coin toss. And because we won the coin toss, uh, that's the only thing we won that day, by the way, uh, I deferred to the second half. And so they're coming down the field, and they are just going down with ease. And one of my team players, one of my players is on the sideline, says, hey, Big guy, number six foot, six foot three guy, doesn't have a mouth guard. And that's one of the rules. You got to have a mouth guard. So I'm like, hey, Mr. Ref, Mr. Ref, big guy doesn't have a mouth guard in. He's not, easy, he's not hard to miss. He doesn't have a mouth guard in. Mr. Ref ignores me, right? So I'm like, hey, Mr. Ref, he doesn't have a mouth guard. They start the next play, throw a little side pass to him. He comes around the corner, boom, he's gone. Touchdown. I'm like, Mr. Ref, he didn't have a mouth guard in. You can call that one back, right? Should have thrown the flag already. He didn't have a mouth guard in. He's like waving me off, waving me off. No, no, I'm not calling it back. He's, I'm not calling it back. I'm like, hey, come on, man. You got to call that back. He broke the rules very clearly. Now, what you need to understand is not having a mouth guard in has no competitive advantage at all. 
It's not like you run slower because you got a mouth guard in or run faster. Like it's like the wind resistance. You take it out. It doesn't trick people like, oh, look, they thought he had the ball because he had a mouth guard in. Like there's no competitive advantage whatsoever. But I'm all over the road. So finally, he's waving me off, waving me off. And I'm like, this is when I feel all the anger of the day. It's boiling up and it's getting higher and higher and higher. And I'm like, now it's not even about the mouth guard. And what I realize in this moment is he may not have had a mouth guard in, but I wasn't guarding my heart, all right? So I say, Mr. Ralph, you gotta call it back. No, 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 I'm not gonna call it back. I said, oh, okay. I see how it is. I know you, you uh, ref high school games. I guess when you ref those, you don't make them wear helmets either. Is what Mr. Ref did. Flag on the play. Personal foul on the coach for this, for the Patriots. Yes, we are the Patriots. On the, for the coach for the Patriots. And I'm sitting there going, oh, gosh. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, one more out of you, and I'm going to kick you out of this game, and you won't even be able to come back this season. And I almost said, I will come back because I'll call the mayor. That's what I almost said because I know him, and I'll call him, and I promise I'll come back. But I held that in. The anger did not let that come out. I held that in with everything I had, and then I realized I've been, because you say all this, if you're, if you're a coach, you know what I'm talking about. You want the ref to hear, but you really want the parents behind you to hear. That's what you really want. You want to make sure everybody knows you're mad when you're angry. So I've been yelling all this, and I realized, like, Pastor Sean is on the sideline. There's people on the other team that go to our church. There's, the coach goes to our church. People go to our church. And Pastor Sean is on the sideline yelling and screaming at this ref and just got a flag thrown at him and threatened to get kicked out. And I'm like, this isn't who I want to be. That's not the guy I want to be. That's not what I want to act like. That's not who I want. That's not what I want to say. It was no competitive advantage. So at halftime, I go out in the field and I'm like, hey, Jeff, this guy's name, ref's name, Jeff. He's one of the nicest guys in the world. I'm like, Jeff, I'm sorry, man. He's like, well, let me explain to you, like, why in football, you know, the helmet, you know, his helmet's not the same. I'm like, Jeff, I know the helmet's not the same. I, I'm, I, I didn't ever think, if you think I thought that was the same, then we got a lot of work to do. I didn't think that was the same. I was just being a jerk. And I came here in a bad mood, and I'm sorry I was being a jerk, and you didn't deserve that. Nobody deserved that. I just hope you'll forgive me, man. I'm sorry. And I walked back over to the sidelines, and I told my team, I was like, hey, coach shouldn't act like that. Because you know what happens. As soon as coach acts like that, teammate starts to act like that too. Then they're mouthing off and everything. And so I'm like, hey, coach shouldn't have acted like that. that, that that's not what we're supposed to do. And I made it right, and I realized I had let my day create something inside of me that was anger, and that anger came out. And it changed me. It wasn't who I wanted to be at all. It wasn't what I wanted to be like, what I wanted to talk like, who I, what I wanted to act like. That isn't who I went out there to coach for. I didn't come out there to coach to show them that. I went out there to show them who, what a man of God could look like. And all of a sudden, I'm getting flags thrown on me because of a mouth guard that didn't even matter. I'm like, man, this is not who I want to be. And what I realized is that one day, that one moment, it changed me. And then I thought about a lot of us who we've got some anger that's been living with us and boiling up inside of us for weeks or maybe months or maybe even years. I saw what one really bad day could do just to boil up inside of me to make me act like I didn't want to act and make me change. And what I'm realizing is that there's a lot of anger in a lot of us. It's moved in, unpacked its bags, and it's been living with us for a really long time. And so no matter your age, or your stage, or where you're at in life, anger can affect us, and it can change us. In fact, the scripture is pretty clear about anger. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this. It says, go ahead and be angry. We'll talk about that later, by the way, what that means, how you can go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, he says. What, what is that about? We'll talk about that. But don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. I love that phrase, don't go to bed angry, because I was thinking about that. What does that mean? Don't go to bed angry. It means don't have the type of anger that you get so comfortable with that you just go to bed every night okay with living with it. Don't have the kind of anger in your life that you get so comfortable with it. It's just a part of your life. Don't have the kind of bitterness and anger that boils up inside of you that you're like, it doesn't even matter. I just go to bed every night knowing I take it to bed with me. In other words, don't take your anger to bed with you. Don't get intimate with your anger. And some of us have gotten so used to our anger 
so used to. It's always there, about to boil over on the inside. It's always a part of us. We've gotten so used to it that it has changed us. And the scripture actually tells us here, not only can it change you, it gives a foothold to your enemy, the enemy of your soul, Satan, who wants to kill, steal, and destroy every part of your life. And he can use your anger as a way to get into your life and to destroy you and to kill your dreams and to steal your peace. And to steal the good joy that you could have in life. It creates emotions and it allows a supernatural thing to happen, the Bible tells us. So if, the, if anger is that dangerous and anger can change us and we've seen anger change us and we've all had the flags called on us in life, then what do we do about it? How do we deal with the anger? Well, I think that leads us to a couple of questions that have to be asked. And the first question is, well, where does the anger come from? Where where is this anger inside of me coming from? You remember last weekend we talked about there are seeds that are planted, and some of those seeds will bear fruit, and they're from Holy Spirit, but some of those seeds are weeds, and they grow up in our lives, and they choke out the fruit, and those weeds grow up, and we don't deal with them, and they change us. And so we got to ask ourselves, where is this coming from? What was the seed that was planted? How did we get there? Was it an event? Like, like you got fired? And that really hurt you and shaped you and you're so angry at them that you're angry at all of authority? Or was it the person that told you I'll be with you forever but then they walked out on you and forever was really short and you don't understand how that happened? Or was it the person that told you that they would be your friend and that they would walk with you through everything but then as soon as things got hard they left you or maybe they even betrayed you? Was it an event that happened? You gotta trace it back, you gotta do the work and go, where was the seed that I have not picked the weed of. I didn't let it go. I wasn't able to go, you know what, I'll just let that go. I'll forgive them. But instead, it stayed with me. But even more important than where is your anger coming from, which I think we need to do the hard work, the difficult word of figuring out, where is it that this anger comes from? When was this seed planted? But we need to also ask our question, another question is, where is the anger taking you? Because here's the thing about anger, it never takes you where you're supposed to be. Anger never gets you to your destiny. Anger never takes you to the destination that God has for you. Anger always takes you on a different path than where you were supposed to end up. And so if we wanna be where God wants us to be and want his destiny for our lives, then we have to ask ourselves, well, where did this anger come from and where is it taking us? And how do we figure this out? So let's go to the Bible. Let's talk about a Bible character. His name is Moses. Now, a lot of people know Moses. Even if you've not been around church or been around the Bible, you may know who Moses is. He's the guy who said, let my people go to Pharaoh. He's the guy who split the Red Sea. He's, he's the guy who got the Ten Commandments. And you might be going, okay, wait a minute. I've not been around the Bible very long. Um, was Moses also the one that had the ark and the water and all that? No, no, no. That was Steve Carell in Evan Almighty. That's who that was. No, no that was Noah. And so Noah did that. But anyway, Moses is this guy who rescued the Jewish people out of bondage and took them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And he takes these people out of Egypt. And because of that, there are miracles all along the way. Because you've got to imagine they were slaves and they were, uh, everything was provided for them as slaves as far as food and place to live. Obviously not in a good way, but they never had to like figure that stuff out. And now they're all of a sudden on their own. And where do they get water from? And where do you get food from? And how do you set up camp? And all of those things. And so God comes through with miracle after miracle. And in fact, in terms of water, um, what he would do is like, so Moses and God would meet and they would talk and he would tell them the problems that they were having. And then Moses would say, okay, here's what you do. Like this one case, he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your staff. And remember, Moses always had the staff. He said, now I want you to go over to this rock and I want you to, to strike the rock. And when you strike the rock, water is going to come out of it. Now you got to imagine this is a million plus people. This isn't like, oh, strike the rock so you can fill up a couple of canteens for your family. No, this is like a, a waterfall starts to happen. A cistern is created. A water source for a million people is created. And so he goes over and with that, strikes the rock and God provides miraculously water. He provides miraculously food. He provides miraculously their freedom. Like it's unbelievable what God is doing. We're watching this rescue plan right in front of our eyes as God provides thing after thing and time after time. But eventually, it gets to a place where um, the water source is starting to dry up and it's not providing water like it used to anymore. So what does Moses do? He goes back to God. He says, hey, 
here's our problem, here's what's going on. And as you can imagine, the people are starting to get a little anxious. They're anxious about what's going on with this water source, and they're starting to complain. If you ever have to lead anybody, you know they're going to complain. If you lead any group of people, you imagine having a million plus people who see that their water source is starting to dry up. And so all of this is happening, and the Bible tells us in the story that God tells Moses and Aaron to gather all of the people together so that he can tell them the solution that he's going to have to the source. And he says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. Last time, you remember, you went to the rock, and you struck the rock, and water came out. But this time, I want you to show my power even in a better way, because you're not even going to have to do anything physical to the rock. I just want you to go and speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, it's going to give you new water and a new water source. And everything that the people are worried about is going to be taken care of, Moses. Just follow my instructions, and you'll be okay. So the people are complaining, and they're starting to get on Moses' nerves. And he's having to gather a million people. And as you can imagine, it took probably a month to do, and he's gathering them all up. And then it shows us this scene where Moses shows us what's in his heart and what comes out. Because God has told him to speak to the rock. And instead, Moses goes out, and it tells us that he speaks to the people. But not only does he speak to the people, look at how he speaks to the people. Look at the first two words. It says, Moses speaks to the people, and he says, listen, rebels. Now, if you want to start off a conversation in a way that people are going to listen to you, saying, listen, rebels, is probably not the way to do it. If your spouse starts off with a, hey, listen, it's not going to go well. For either one of you. If a boss comes out of his office, hey, listen, rebels, it's not going to go good. What if I'd come up here this weekend and I'd said, all right, listen up, you sinners and heathens. Got something for you today. I want you to listen to. It's not going to go well, right? And so Moses, who is supposed to speak to the rock and show God's power, doesn't speak to the rock. He actually speaks to the people. He doesn't obey God. And then he's surprised that when he doesn't obey God, that it doesn't work. He starts to get frustrated. Have you ever had that happen in your life? God gives you some pretty, pretty uh, specific instructions. He tells you how to handle something. He gives you instructions in his word of how to handle something, and then you don't handle it the right way, and you're like, I can't believe that didn't work. So he's starting to get more and more frustrated. He's talking to them like, listen, you rebels, and God has given him the solution to his circumstances. Now, oftentimes, the solution to our circumstances is that we change ourselves. Oftentimes, the solution to our circumstances is that God is going to change our circumstances. He's going to do something in and among people to move in. Them. Oftentimes, it's, it's that he's going to work in a way that we can't even picture or imagine, and he's just so faithful, and he's going to do what he needs to do. But he's given Moses the solution. And rather than speaking to his circumstances, which he told him to do, like, hey, call out life, call out water from the rock, and it's going to do. He goes and he gets angry at the people because they're frustrated. So he speaks to the people. How often is your anger not even directed at the people that you're angry at? How often is your anger not even about what you're talking about? In that moment when I went back to talk to the Rev, and he's like, hey, let me explain to you the rules and why a helmet is different. It wasn't about the mouth guard. It wasn't about the helmet. It was about something inside of me that needed to change. It wasn't about the, the people, Moses. It's not that they're frustrated. In fact, why can't you be a great leader, Moses, and actually get to a place where you go, gosh, I bet they are a little bit worried about not having water. That's pretty important. I bet I need to lead them to a place where they can trust God. Yeah, I've seen God provide over and over again, and they've seen God provide over and over again, but it's still something I need to lead them to. I need to help them to trust. And so Moses starts with anger, but then look what he says. He says, do we have to bring water out of this rock for you, Moses says. He says, listen, rebels, do we have to do everything for you? Can you imagine Moses? He's up there he's in front of the people. He's like, listen, do I have to do everything for you? I mean, you're complaining and you're whining and you, you didn't even gather well. It took us a month to get you together. Do Aaron and I have to do everything do we have to bring water out of this rock for you? I saw that we in there, and I thought, what we is Moses talking about? He'd be wise to be talking about him and God, but I don't think he is. I think he's talking about him and Aaron. Do we, my brother and I, do we have to do everything for you? It's really arrogant, isn't it? 
to think that he did anything to begin with, to think that it was his staff hitting the rock. I mean, I could hit this speaker all day long, and I don't think any water is going to come out of it because I don't have any power to make water come out of it. But Moses thought for just a minute that it was his actions, that he was actually doing something. He thought for just a minute, he's telling the people, like, do I have to lead you everywhere? Do I have to do everything for you? And then he keeps on going. He keeps on going. It says, then, what that, Moses raises his arm, and he slams his staff against the rock. Once, no, twice, in anger, Moses goes and does what he was most comfortable with. You see that? In our anger, we often go back to our time of comfort. Whatever makes us feel more comfortable. It hadn't worked. Speaking to the people, complaining to the people hadn't worked, but that's not what God had told him to do. God told him to go and speak to the rock and water would come out. And then he's so surprised and so angry about it that he actually returns to what had worked before. Remember, before Moses had struck the rock and water had come out. And so rather than obeying God, he just went back to what made him comfortable. All right, God, you've used my staff before, so I will strike the rock out of anger, and I know that you'll do what you'll need to do. And then it says, though, that water poured out, and congregation and cattle drank. So it worked. Water comes out. Twice. Moses is in a bad place. Anger takes over. Instead of speaking, he slams, and I don't mean like slam poetry, like the cool stuff. He slams in anger the people. But we're going to learn a lot about Moses in this moment, and we're going to learn how not to be like Moses, and we're going to learn from Moses, and, and the people in the Bible, that's what we do. We understand that they are just like us, that they make mistakes like us, that they, they sin like us, and so we're going to learn that. But the most important person, the most important thing we can learn from is the character of God, and I want you to see something in the character of God right here in this place. That God still provides a miracle of water, even though Moses blew it. And it teaches us that even when we are faithless, God is faithful. That he comes through for the people and what they needed, even though Moses didn't come through. That God came through and was exactly who he needed to be in that moment. And so, kind of see this story, and we're like, all right, Moses had some anger come out. Uh, it's all good. Maybe God's going to have a conversation with him. Call him over and say, like, all right, Mo, take some time out. Like, just sit down. Like, you need, to, you need to go away for a little while. Get yourself together. You know, come back. Have an apology, that kind of thing. And see that happening. But that's not what happens. In fact, there's another flag. Oops. Another flag thrown. Boom. Flag on the play. Moses, what's going on here? Look at this next passage says, God said to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't trust me, didn't treat me with holy reverence in front of the people of Israel, you two, singles out Moses and Aaron, you two are not going to lead them into the promised land that I'm giving them. Wow. That escalated quickly. Moses and Aaron are like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. The promised land? I mean, this is all we've been looking forward to. This is what we've been leading to. What do you mean the promised land? What do you mean we can't go into the promised land, God? You're not going to get to your destiny. And as I read that, it feels like, man, God, are you being a little harsh? Like, I mean, I understand they lost their temper, but we lose our temper sometimes too. And I realize he's you got to work on Moses some. He needs to be worked on. But, I mean, shouldn't you just give him some time out? Shouldn't you just... Had him take a deep breath, do some breathing exercises, come back and apologize. Shouldn't that be? I mean, even the nice ref, when he threw a flag on me, God, didn't throw me out of the game. He threatened to, but he didn't throw me out of the game. I mean, didn't, aren't you going to give him another chance, God? And it makes us wonder because we understand the character of God. He just provided water for the people even though Moses didn't do what he was supposed to do. And we realize that there's got to be something else going on. There's got to be more to this story. And then we start to remember back on Moses' son. Anybody remember the Ten Commandments? Moses goes up on the top of the mountain, gets the Ten Commandments from God. He's coming down the mountain. He sees that the people are with Aaron. 
and they've melted down gold and they've made golden calves and they're worshiping these false gods and they're partying and they're doing all the things. And Moses in that moment is literally the first person to break the Ten Commandments because he takes the commandments and he throws them down in anger and he shatters the commandments everywhere. Instead of going and loving the people, bringing them into repentance, saying, I just met with God and God has something better for us. In his anger, he literally breaks the commandments. Or let's go back, let's go back. When he was the prince of Egypt, you remember the Disney movie, The Prince of Egypt? You Maybe you've seen that and you remember Moses' story. So he was a Hebrew, but he was put into the river by his mother to save him. And so the uh, Pharaoh's daughter sees him and picks him up and raises him. And so Moses, his whole life, realizes, like, I am not like the people who are raising me. He can look at his skin and tell. And so he sees that he's different, and he sees that the slaves are like him, and he realizes that the slaves are his people, and his name even means the saved one. And so he's got these issues his whole life that I'm the saved one, and I've got this life of luxury, and the people that are like me are out there, and they're living as slaves. And the scripture tells us that because of that, he's got some issues going on. In Exodus 2, 11 and 12, it says, many years later, When Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. And after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. And I kind of always had this uh, way of looking at this story, and maybe it's the Disney version of it even, that Moses was out there, he sees this going on. He's like, oh, hey, guys, don't do that, don't do that. And he's trying to break up the fight. And he's like, hey, you're better than that. You know, and he's talking to the Egyptians who he has some authority over. And he's like, hey, don't be like that, don't do that. And he's talking to the Hebrews and he's settling them. And then they're trying to fight and he pushes the Egyptian away and says, hey, you gotta stop doing that. And he stumbles and he falls and he hits a rock and he breaks his skull open and he dies. And Moses is like, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. And he's covering him up and trying to cover up his sin, but as I read the scripture, I don't really believe that's how it happened at all. In fact, it tells us that Moses saw what he saw, but then it gives us this little phrase, and it's this phrase that says, he waited until the timing was right. He he waited until no one was looking, and I don't think that was just in that moment, because there were slaves all around working, there were people building, there there were taskmasters all around. No, no, that wasn't the time. He waited Until no one was looking and the anger boiled up and the anger boiled up. And then eventually he took matters into his own hands and he committed cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Anger. There's anger there. And so there's this anger that swells up inside of him. And so when we get to this moment where there is this anger boiling up in Moses and he takes his staff And he comes out and he addresses the crowd and he's like, hey, you rebels. And he's screaming at them and he strikes hard the rock two times. This is not the first time that God has dealt with this out of Moses. In fact, what I think God would have said is, Moses, we've been working on this for 80 years. Remember when you killed the man and I took you into the desert and I tried to help you as best I could and I I got you alone with your soon to be father-in-law and you were you had a simple life and a quiet life and I just taught you and I prepared you and then I called you and you were so humble when I called you and I called you to do what I need you to do but then I saw your anger come out you again you spent time with me but you came straight out of time with me and the anger came out again and then this is just another instance of it boiling up to the surface in such a way. But I imagine if we've got these three incidents in Moses' life, that there was little micro incidences all around where the people would have said, Moses, you got some issues. And God is saying it's because of this, Moses. We've been dealing with this for such a long time. You haven't picked the weeds. You haven't done what you were supposed to do. You, 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 this is something we've been dealing with and that you haven't done the hard work. And now you can't go to the place that I wanted you to go, the promised land. You can't get to the destination that I had for you any longer, Moses. You're not ready for it. You're not equipped for it. And it shows me that anger will always keep you from God's best in your life. And there's some anger right now that's, that's always there 
it's always about to boil up. It, it, it comes out in this unforgiveness. It comes out as bitterness. It comes out as rage. It comes out against a whole people group or maybe just against someone who hurt you. But it's always there. And here's my promise to you. You will never be who God wants you to be as long as that anger is in control of you. You'll never get to where God wants you to get in your relationships, in your work, in your life until you deal with the anger, until you say, where is this coming from and where is this going to take me? And so we can look at Moses' life and we can see there he's got issues. He deals with them over and over again. And we can learn from Moses about how not to react. But how do we react then in anger? And where do we learn that from? Well, we learn that from Jesus. We learn everything that is good, we learn from Jesus. And so Jesus has something to teach us about anger. The first thing that Jesus has to teach us about anger is that Jesus got angry. I don't know if you know that or not, but Jesus got angry. In fact, there's this one time when Jesus got really angry. He goes into the temple, the church of that day, and he finds that the religious people are cheating poor people. And here's what they would do. So they would have a turtle dove, for example, that they were bringing in for the sacrifice. And they needed a sacrifice to get to the sacrificial system of the temple to have their sins forgiven. And so many of them would make, they would travel for great distances to come and to make this sacrifice. And they come into the temple with their turtle dove and they present it to the person who's to approve it, the religious leader, who is to say, yes, you can go and sacrifice that turtle dove. And that religious leader would go, oh, look at there. There's a blemish on this turtle dove. This turtle dove's not going to work. It was a perfectly good dove. But they would go, that one's not going to work. Well, what am I going to do? I've got a sacrifice today. I traveled all this way. What am I going to do? Well, good for you. We have another turtle dove that you can buy from us. We'll keep this old blemished one, and you go and buy this one. And then they would later sell the other one that they just took from the man. And over and over again, they were making money, reselling, reselling these turtle doves over and over again and ripping off the poor and taking advantage of these people who had to come and make a sacrifice. And so Jesus comes in, and he literally flips out. Like, he flips out. And what I mean by that is he flips tables. He flips over the tables. He flips over things. He takes a whip, and he starts to drive out the animals, and he's driving everybody out, and he is flipping out in anger. Tells us that he goes over and says, then, going over to the people who sold the doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Jesus is mad. Jesus is passionate. He is angry. And he is passionate. And yet we know that Jesus does not sin. Jesus actually is, there's a prophecy that said that the Messiah would come and he would be consumed with zeal for my house, says the Lord. And Jesus is living out that prophecy. So not only is he sinless, he's actually living out the prophecy in this anger that the Bible had predicted he would. So Jesus teaches us something in this moment. He uses anger in a different way. He uses anger differently than we do. The anger is not coming from a heart issue. It's, it's not coming from a childhood issue. It's not coming from sin. Jesus was sinless, and we know this, and yet he's able to be angry, and he's able to come and to use this representing God with his anger. See, see Moses was supposed to represent God. He did it in anger in a way that did not represent God. Pastor Coach Sean was supposed to represent God. But he wasn't representing God when the anger came out. But Jesus is doing it in a way that represents God. Well, what did Jesus do that gives us this insight into how we can use anger differently? Well, Jesus shows us that anger needs to be a tool and not a weapon. See, right here we got a hammer. We all know what hammers are for. They're tools, right? There's, there's people in this church who have gone and built ramps for people in our local missions that have helped them get in their house and they use a hammer. It's a tool. There, there are people within our church who have gone to Haiti and built houses with a hammer. There, there, there are people in here who have gotten their honey list done because of a hammer. And so they, they have got everything, everything. This is a good tool when it's used. It's built places that the gospel has been able to go out. It's built things that have been able to help families live. This is a tool. But we also know that this could be used as a weapon. Oh, this could hurt somebody. This could hurt people. This could hurt things. This could destroy things. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we using our anger as a tool or as a weapon? Moses had a staff. We love Moses' staff. Remember early on, God used it as a tool. 
to show him that he was God when he questioned about whether he could be who he needed to be. He said, throw it down on the ground, Moses. And he threw his staff on the ground, and he did. It became a snake, a serpent. And then he was like, Moses, pick it back up. And Moses picked it back up, and he saw that it was a staff again, and he realized, oh, yeah. God is real, and he will do what he said he's going to do. Remember Moses had the staff? He raises his hands in the air, and then he points at the sea, and the sea splits, and the people are able to walk to safety away from the Egyptian bondage that they had been in. Their freedom was part, it was a tool. He said, Moses, if you'll strike the rock, water will pour out of it. Moses used it as a tool to get up the mountain. To see the very face of God, it was used as a tool in Moses' life when he was a shepherd. That's where he first got it. He was a shepherd learning how to lead sheep because God wanted him to learn how to lead people. So it was a tool. But then we also saw that that same staff was not just used as a tool, but it was used as a weapon when Moses came in and said, Hey, you rebels! screamed at him, when he slammed it on the rock, disobeying God in the way that he had called him to do things, it was used as a weapon. And the interesting thing about anger is that psychologists and sociologists tell us that anger is a secondary emotion. In other words, it's not the emotion that you ever feel first. You don't ever just get angry. You feel something else. You feel disappointed. You feel betrayed. You feel sad, you feel hurt, you feel like you don't know what to do, confused. And so you feel that feeling, and the secondary emotion is that you get anger. And for a lot of us, it's the only emotion that we ever show. We feel all kinds of emotions in here, all kinds of things that are going on, but yet we only emote, we only ever give out anger. But the good thing about anger being a secondary emotion is that it can be controlled because if it's a secondary emotion, you feel something first. You, you feel that offense. You feel that bitterness. You feel that betrayal. You, you feel that hurt and that pain. And because you feel it, you can actually deal with it. The scripture actually says that we capture the thought that we have and then we deal with it and we begin to work through it and that means I can control it. So I have the ability to control my anger because it's a secondary emotion if I will do the hard work of realizing how and where it came from and where it's trying to take me. And when I realize that, I can put horns on it. No, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This anger that wants to come out is from the enemy of my soul who wants to destroy my relationships, destroy my finances, destroy my health, wants to destroy everything about me, and he's trying to get to me. And so we have to control it. And so, so Jesus, he had a whip, and his anger came out. And we see him with this whip, but he never hit the people with it. He drove out all the animals with it to get them out. He was using it as a tool, not a weapon. Jesus used his anger to accomplish a purpose, not to just give him a good feeling. Because that's what we all say that we need to do, right? What, what we, need, we need to do is we just need to release our anger. I just had to get rid of it. I just got to release the anger. I just got to release the anger. And here's what I want to tell you. The number one thing not to do when you're angry is to release it. But here, I want to tell you the number one thing you need to do. You need to release it. Wait, wait, wait. I thought he said not to release it. Then he told us to release it. Here's the difference. One is to release it where it just goes out and spreads like a virus. The other is to release it to God and say, this is yours. I don't get to have it anymore. And once you release it to God, here's what you're telling your anger. You don't own me. You don't own me. See, when we're under the control and influence of our emotion that's called anger and letting that control us in every way and we walk around saying, I just can't help it. I'm always, it's always about to boil out. We just haven't dealt with the fact that we are owned by the betrayal. We are owned by the offense. We are owned by the anger. We are owned by the thing that is in us that's grown up like a weed and we haven't taken the time to pick the weeds so that the fruit can grow, so that something else besides anger can come out. And it's in that moment that we've got to say, you don't own me. You don't get to own me. You're, you're literally saying it to the people that have hurt you as well. You don't own me. You don't own me anymore. Have you ever thought about how crazy it is 
that you're waiting on the very person who broke you to come and do something to put you back together? Why would you trust them with that anyway? Well, when they say they're sorry, then I can deal with this. They're the ones who broke you. Why would you trust them with putting you back, the pieces back together? There's only one. And so you say, God, I give you all of this. I forgive them even if they haven't said they're sorry. I let them off the hook. How can I let them off the hook and forgive them when they did something they weren't supposed to do? Isn't that what God did for me? Isn't that what God did for you? And so in that moment, I'm releasing it. I'm saying, you, you don't owe me anymore. I'm going to use this anger as a tool, not a weapon. And I'm going to use it as a tool to get down deep to the weeds, show me what's there, why is this boiling up, and where is it taking me? So I want to ask you that question. Where did it come from? Have you done the hard work of digging down deep enough to see where it came from, where the seed was planted? Was it an event? Was it a person? Was it your parents divorcing that let you down and you just thought, I never will trust again? Was it the fact that he hit you and he said he would love you forever? Was it the fact that a business partner walked out on you when they said that you could trust them? Was it the fact that the boss fired you when you knew they were just as involved as you were in the mistake? Where did it come from? How long have you been going to bed with it? Every night, it's just a part of you now. You go to bed angry, you wake up angry. It's who you are. And how long will it take for you to realize that the place that it's taking you is not where God wants you to be? I hope it'll be today. During our response time, what you have is the opportunity to just go to the cross and just repent. Say, God, I've been hanging on this for a long time. Yeah, they hurt me, but now I've been disobeying you. Maybe just go to the cross and you say, God, I I, I release this to you. It's no longer mine to carry around. It's no longer mine to be angry about. I release it to you. It doesn't matter what they do. God, I just want to be in right standing with you. Maybe for you it's going to the communion table and remembering that your only reason that you have been forgiven is because of the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. And maybe when you're taking communion today, not only you just receive it for yourself, but you pray it over that person that hurt you. Because the only thing that they need and the only thing that you need is Jesus. And then we're able to go to our prayer team and pray with people. Maybe the most vulnerable thing you could do today is just to walk up to one of our prayer team members and say, I'm angry and I don't want to be anymore. Can I speak life the situation and let the water flow again. This not the water, anger, waters of anger, but God, your water that you want to pour in my life. And then for a lot of us, the anger has confused us. The bitterness, the unforgiveness, you've lived with it for so long, you don't even know which way to go. What is God's next move for your life? Well, here's what I know. The scripture promises is that God will lay out every step for those who love him. Every step, every step, every step, every step. Sometimes the anger just clouds us to where we can't see it and it's just too dark from the anger. Why don't you go to the candles today and just light a candle saying, God, would you light a path? The person that walks out of this room could be so different than the one who walked in. If you will leave it behind, release it and let it go. It doesn't have to own you. God, would you let us all feel your presence now. God, you want to move in our lives. You want to do incredible and amazing things for us. But we got to make the first move, God. I pray that the crosses would be full. This is not the time to leave, God. So just speak to those now. The crosses would be full of repentance. Candles would be lit and signifying what you're going to do and light people's paths. Prayer team would be able to pray supernatural Holy Spirit prayers over people and that God you would lead us into your path in Jesus name we pray we release it to you now amen